I'm somewhat of an anachronism being raised by my grandmother, who uh, told me all kinds of stories about blackouts and the rationing, and, and uh, her husband was uh, in the Navy V-5, and uh, we have his, uh, his, uh, his Navy manual, and I was always fascinated by Morse code and everything like that. But uh, my great uncle was also in World War II, and he was a bomber pilot. Um, Blue B-17s, and he was kind of my male role model growing up. And uh, we never asked him anything about what uh, any of the war stories, because I always thought it was kind of rude to ask. But apparently, he just nobody ever asked him, so he never told. Um, and uh, so I asked him, and he was like, "Well, do you want a serious one, or do you want a, a funny one?" Because I always like his sense of humor. And I said, "Well, how about a funny one?" And he was like, "Okay, I'll, I'll write one out for you." And incidentally, also, uh, me and my uh, great uncle Roger, um, our favorite band was uh, is Glenn Miller, and uh, his uh, his wife uh, Bunny was uh, she was like, no, that's not your favorite band. You must have liked something else. And I was like, well, I sort of like Aerosmith, but I really like Glenn Miller. <laughs> so this is his story, and it's called "Going to War with Lieutenant Ayers." The U.S. Air Corps had a huge job in 1941 after Pearl Harbor was attacked to build planes, airplanes, train air crews, and prepare to go to war. The B-17 Flying Fortress was a four-engine heavy bomber with a crew of ten. Crew members, mostly 19 and 20-year-olds, who had no prior experience flying, were sent to radio schools, navigation schools, gunnery schools, flight engineer schools, and taught to pilot and use the revolutionary Norden bomb site to bomb enemy positions. Once these ten crew members had received specialized training, uh, lasting from six months to 16 months, they were chosen randomly to create a crew and train together before going to combat. This newly designated crew arrived independently at Dyersburg, Tennessee Air Corps Base to train together as a team in two months' time before joining the conflict in Europe, where crews survived in part by how well they learned their skills and training together and functioning like a well-oiled machine. Understandably, members of the crew who are just starting to get acquainted are silently judging the airmen whom they will be risking their lives. In preparing crews for combat, the training command try to anticipate all eventualities that crew might face in combat. The 8th Air Force, based in England, crossed the English Channel to bomb targets in Germany sometimes. The B-17s damaged from enemy fighters or uh, anti-aircraft guns, flak, would be unable to make the coast of England and would have to ditch or land in the water. The B-17s carried two yellow rafts, and all crew members had life jackets. So with luck, the crew would abandon ship and get into the life raft before the B-17 went to the bottom. One of the training exercises for the recently assembled crew was to practice getting out of the B-17 after the plane had landed on water in the English Channel. The plane would stay afloat about a minute in the best of circumstances. If the sea was running high, and if the best of landings was not executed, the plane would sink much faster. Every crew member was trained to make a hasty exit. The drill took place in the remains of the B-17 that had crashed, but the fuselage and wings were intact. The B-17 was positioned in the middle of the pond. Most training exercises were competitive, and crews were rated or graded on their accomplishments. The training instructor had a stopwatch that started running the instant he blew his whistle until all the crew members were in one of the two life rafts, uh, yellow rafts. Uh, the ditching procedure spelled out in Army Instruction Manual specified that prior to the plane landing on the water, all crewmen would have their combat position, would have left their combat position on the plane and congregated in the safest place for impact in the radio room. The pilot and co-pilot stay in their normal positions in the cockpit until exiting the plane. Once the forward motion of the plane stops, the eight crew member, members in the radio room exit a door near the tail of the fuselage. The pilot and co-pilot exit the side windows in the cockpit. For the training mission, yellow rafts were positioned next to the wing on each side of the plane. In an actual situation, the yellow rafts would have been ejected from the plane. Lieutenant Ayers, the pilot, agile soul that he was, exited the cockpit window and was on the wing before any other crew members. Lieutenant Ayers knew that the captain of the ship should be the last person to abandon it. However, his competitive juices kicked in, and he reasoned that he could speed the evacuation of the crew and take a few seconds of the instructor's stopwatch by going ahead and getting in the rack. 
Unfortunately, when he jumped into the raft, his forward motion set the raft skidding across the pond, and his stranded crew stood on the wing as Lieutenant Air sailed into the sunset. <laughs> the crew regrouped. The instructor started the ditching procedure again by blowing his whistle. Lieutenant Ayers, chagrined but still agile, found himself again the first crew member on the wing. Lieutenant Ayers was a fast learner, so knew not to get into the raft until all his crew were safely in the raft. However, in the process of getting back to the plane after his solo sail across the pond, some water had splashed up on the wing. And at this point, everything in his world seemed to spin out of control. <laughs> Lieutenant Ayers lost his footing on the slippery sloping wing, Found, uh, fought with all his might to regain his balance, <laughs> knew he just couldn't precede his crew into the raft, finally realized that his only choice was to die for the raft, which he did and missed. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Ayers was standing upon three feet of water in the make-believe English Channel, while his incredulous crew was again stranded on the wing thinking they had gone.